Recently, the magazine Rolling Stone released a 360-page volume entitled The History of Rock and Roll. The history deals in great detail with the rock and roll scene. Its very size confirms the influence that rock and pop industry have had on people since the 1950s. The death of Elvis Presley coincided with the release of the book in Australia. Was Presley's premature death an omen signalling the beginning of the end for rock and roll? Or will it continue with its powerful marketing style to dominate musical tastes? In this program we're going to look at the rock and pop industry and talk to promoters, performers and critics. One promoter who's been successful both here and overseas is Paul Dainty and Virginia Dargan asked him about the present day lifespan of pop groups. I think the lifespan of the really talented acts um, is getting longer. Um, before, uh, acts would be around for two, three years in the 60s and they disappear mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are some of the members of those groups have re-emerged in bands in the 70s. But definitely the, the longevity of the talented acts is, is getting longer. What about the lifespan of promoters? I think if you're wise and careful and you don't let your ego get you, get you carried away with what you're doing, um, you're around for a long time. I mean, I intend to be around for the next uh, 25 years. Do you find you have to manage your ego at all? Um, do you, are you tempted to indulge your own musical tastes? Um, I suppose occasionally, if you're honest with yourself, that situation arises where you really fancy presenting an artist, uh, which you know deep down may be rather risky. So then you have to kind of control yourself because it relates back to how much money is involved in gambling on a tour. On your own personal philosophy, have you any commitment to quality with what you... Oh, absolutely, yes. Make? Everything we try to do, my company tries to do, is on a a first-class basis, and I think that is the way the music industry has progressed into the 70s. In, in 10 years ago, uh, you had a situation where groups would just come out with a set of amps as cheaply as possible, and today the thing has gone to the other extreme where the artists will spend almost all their earnings in presenting a show, a quality show to the people, and a promoter will make far less money in terms of presenting that show in the best situation, which didn't happen 10 years ago. The music being listened to by this huge crowd at Paul Dainty's Rock Arena concert owes its origin to rhythm and blues. Rock music came directly from rhythm and blues, which is a black musical form, and existed previous to rock and roll. Many of the elements in rhythm and blues came out of earlier styles, mainly um, the, to some extent the white country western styles, but mostly blues and gospel music. Was there any catalyst that led directly to rock? Yeah, there were a number of specific things which led to it. Um, in particular, there are some important piano styles, such as boogie woogie, blues, and barrel house piano, which led directly to uh, a lot of the characteristic elements of rock that we hear with us very much today. say that rock evolved directly from Negro blues and jazz. It's a pretty useful generalization because it's generally accepted that rock came from rhythm and blues music, which was a uh, a black musical form that existed definitely before rock was born and before rock came to the consciousness of, of white Americans. The main roots for rhythm and blues lie in uh, blues music, piano and guitar music, and also in gospel music, and to, to a small extent also in country western music, which uh, particularly was popular in the south of the United States at that time. Was there any particular catalyst that led directly to rock? There were a number of things. Um, one important factor was the presence of a lot of piano styles which served to introduce characteristic elements which later became part of rock and roll. These were found in boogie woogie piano and blues and barrel house piano styles. And I can demonstrate a couple of those right now if you'd like. Okay. one style, which is a walking A to the bar style. Another important style was a vamp which went something like this and later became used by Chuck Berry in modified form and other, many other guitarists after him.
And it was only a, a small step from that to the kind of um, base patterns that are common in rock. How will historians of the future regard the pop scene of the last 25 years? Will they regard this as an age dominated by pop music? And what will future psychologists think about it all? In terms of the significance of pop for classical music, um, some historians will be interested in that aspect, and I think pop does have an influence on classical music. Um, and some historians just won't see it as a, of any significance. The audience is divided, isn't it? Older tend to go for classical and younger for pop. What is it about pop which is so appealing to young people? Um, I think it's a cult. It's not just the music. And that uh, young people find in it a convenient way to express, express their rebellious sorts of feelings, particularly, say, from the ages of 12 to 25, when uh, the creative uh, urge or the, rebe the rebellious spirit hasn't found a, a practical creative outlet, um, and people are not yet married and, and bound down with other problems, they don't have to take responsibilities for their actions, so they can just sort of let it all hang out. Does it give them a sense of identity? Uh, yes, I think also, of course. Um, in that large numbers of, of other young people are feeling the same way as they do. They don't have a clear goal in, in life or, or anything like that. They, they all, all have this turbulent feeling inside. And the fact that they're all expressing it in the same way makes them feel strong, that it must be right that we all feel this way. I believe that all the, the music business goes in cycles. I mean, we came from the Beatles thing up to very heavy rock bands for the last six, seven years who have been incredibly successful, like Led Zeppelin, The Who, Black Sabbath, and all those kind of groups. And ABBA are kind of a refreshing change and have appealed to that whole area of people out there that so many people always forget exist. And um, that's why they really have the huge success they've had, because, you know, everyone can sing their songs, yeah. you know? With something rather outrageous like punk rock, is it more difficult to predict uh, how long that particular trend might last, for instance? Um, I don't think you can ignore New Wave, which is what it's called in England. Uh, it sounds a lot better than punk rock. Um, it's, it's gotten very big uh, in the UK. There are now five or six groups which have taken over the charts in a, in a very big way. And uh, whether you like the music or you don't like it, it is definitely here to stay for a while. So you have to acknowledge it's there. And here are the Six Pistols, probably the most extreme example of punk rock. Started readers in England have been confronted with headlines such as the Sex Pistols plan to go into hiding after the beatings handed out to Johnny Rotten and Paul Cook. Punk rock or new waves also making its presence felt in Australia. Sue Matthews is a rock critic and also manages an educational radio station. And we asked Sue about the new wave. Yeah, I think new wave is a much broader term than punk rock. I think new wave is used to describe a whole range of music that's being made both in America and in England that's part of a more general movement, whereas punk rock is just one branch of that. Right. Taking punk, how much is it a phenomenon created by image makers who are frantically looking for something different? Well, I suppose to the extent that we're reading about it in the Herald and the Australasian Post and that it's sort of a, a media phenomenon at that level, it is created by image makers. But at the point where it starts, where it began, I think it is a, a very real response to some, you know, very troubling social circumstances. Can you talk about those? Well, for instance, the, in one interview with Johnny Rotten that I read, he was, talks about the life on the dole queue, more or less. You know, these kids in London, unemployed, nothing to do. The society they live in appears to be crumbling. There's terrorism, there's riots, there's violence. And so really what they're doing is making intolerable music as a response to an intolerable situation. So it's a, a valid response to desperation? I think so, yes. I mean, I think that's what you hear in the music. That's why it's so, so rough and grating, is that it is a, an expression of rage and anger and outright. It's also a meeting place for punk rock enthusiasts. What appeals to you most about punk music? Well, that's um, the fact that it's hitting out, it's uh, giving a lot of scope for experimentation, etc. 
Is it still amateurish here in Australia? In Australia, yes, because it's relatively new, of course. And uh, most of the people who are doing it are rather young and haven't yet become that proficient. What about you? Have you got any musical background? Yes, yes. I've had um, two years of uh, electronic music study with Felix Verda. The Melbourne composer? Yeah. What does he think of what you're doing now? I don't know. I haven't seen <laughs> Do you admire any serious composers? Yes, um, Bartok, Stockhausen, his ideas mainly, uh, Cage, uh, Wagner. <laughs> Aren't they very different from this music? Um, yes and no, they're all uh, subversive, you know, they're all sort of hitting out their own way. A lot of people think it's completely destructive and negative, would you agree? Well. At, at the level of, of um, uh, explicit content, it is very, very negative, but what it implies, I, th I think any sort of destruction like that implies a desire for something positive, and I think that that's, that's certainly present in it. Does it have any real relevance to the situation in Australia, do you think, or is it simply a reflection of an overseas craze? Well, I think that punk rock and the, the Sex pistol sort of... Uh, sort of frenetic, wild anger is more specifically related to the situation in Britain. Whereas, as, as Johnny Rotten said, that they'll be sending them food parcels from, from America pretty soon. Whereas our, our, our social situation is quite different. And there's, there's far less um, provocation or, or justification for that, quite that, uh, that violent anger. How long can it last? Um, is it likely to fizzle out once its capacity to shock is exhausted? I think that's possible, yes. I think that, that uh, because, because it's musically fairly limited, I think it is something that, that, that is a, a part of a trend that will, will pass. Uh, well, it's really the only creative art that I've got, uh, so as it's very important to me. What else do you do? Would I go you to read? art school, yeah. I read, yeah. What do you read? Uh, well, I don't know. I've given up, sort of given up reading books for the fact that I can't find writers who I like the styles of. What have you read in the past and uh, liked? I re used to like science fiction a lot. I gave that up about three years ago. Um, I like Evelyn Moore. I still like Nick Cohn a lot. People like that, journalist people. What do your parents think of your lifestyle? Um, they think I'm a wimp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're just sort of can't make it out, can't understand it type of thing. Do you live away from home? No, with them. What kind of music does your band play? Mm, varies a lot. It says a lot which um, most new wave bands would think was sort of uh, uh, too, too sort of unenergetic and sort of ideas type. We're much more based on ideas than most other bands. What kinds of ideas? Are they largely destructive ideas? No. no. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, we don't sing pro-Nazi songs or anything. What like do that. you sing? Oh, songs that have something... Oh, they mainly have something to do with us. Lots of times they're sort of played characters and stuff. Do they have uh, to do with your own lives? Yes, yeah. a great deal. Just past experiences and things. Are they played so loudly that the lyrics are drowned, or are the lyri lyrics a large part of the song? Very large yeah. part. I mean, you know, there's no point in writing the lyrics if they're going to be drawn yeah. out. What are some of the titles? Model of Youth, Seems So Distant, uh, My Empire, Broken Hands. What's Broken Hands about? Self-mutilation. Are you involved in that? No, it's really about sort of self-mutilation in the cause of love or, you know, as in, you know, people going out and punching walls type of thing. Um, Sheer frustration. Yeah, frustration type thing, not as in putting a safety pin through your lower lip um, to be hip or something. So how much are you actually directly involved with what you're singing about, or is it second-hand experience? It's first-hand, largely. Largely first-hand. Sing about some experiences of uh, people we know, but it's largely first-hand experience. What instruments are in the group? Synthesizer, um, saxophone, guitars, guitars drums, bass and drums, and vocalists. How old are you? 17. 19.
how does a promoter successfully play in a concert like Rock Arena with bands like Little River Band, Santana and Fleetwood Mac? Is it a matter of backing your own hunches or of scientific market research when you're promoting pop music? I don't think you can back too many hunches with the kind of money involved in promoting rock concerts, which is uh, always in six figures. You really more follow a trend that's been created by various people and the current successful acts that are already around. So you don't have anything to do with, with predicting trends, you're more capitalising on ones already established? Absolutely, yes. Do you have a much contact with young people yourself? Oh yes, I mean most of my staff who work for me are all uh, under 30 and it's more of a young people's business uh, today than it ever was uh, in the rock business. An individual concert um, or tour means um, the gambling of an enormously large amount of money. Have you got an iron nerve? Well, yeah, I think you have to be uh, not too much of a worrier. And if you really believe in the artist you're selling or the act you're selling, such as an ABBA or a wing situation, uh, and you know your business, I mean, there is no real risk involved. How tough do you think you have to be personally? Uh, I think you have to be fairly tough within the business when you're setting shows up, because otherwise the various services and people you use will... Uh, see a million dollars in every show you're doing and uh, accordingly try and take as much from you as they can for providing a service. Adverse uh, publicity, I imagine, could completely wreck a certain tour with, with parents um, getting cold feet and, and taking the pocket money away. Do you have much to do with the whole publicity machine yourself? Uh, yes, we have a permanent publicist who covers all our tours. But in terms of parents being worried about their children going to uh, concerts. I think that is the smallest part of the concert area in that age bracket. You're talking about acts like the Bay City Rollers, yes. um, which really aren't the biggest concert attractions. And in, if you ask me which is the biggest risk area in promoting shows, I would say in that uh, 10 to 17 market, that is the, the riskiest market. In the popular field, one is looking to um, find something that will be very attractive, something for which there is a pretty good idea of what kind of product is required. One interesting fact that bears on this a lot is the, the recent innovation whereby people, um, usually young women in the age 11 to 17, who are the most uh, important part of the, of the singles market, are wired up for their galvanic skin response. And as a result of the, the electrical signals which they generate um, in response to the playing of certain musical tracks, um, important decisions are made. For example, if one has an album and one wants to know which track will have the best response, one wires up a group of volunteers, measures the galvanic skin response, and from that picks the, s the single, which is usually the best choice in terms of uh, success. Have you ever been tempted to enter the field of classical music promotion? Um, I often have the feeling I'd like to. It'd have to be something fairly special, and maybe it would be a bit self-indulgent, but maybe along the lines of uh, Leonard Bernstein conducting a symphony orchestra here in Australia. Paul Dainty's told us that he's interested possibly in promoting classical concerts, and now we ask well-known Australian composer George Dreyfus what his feelings are about the pop scene. Oh, I think there is nothing in the world that one didn't want to have done sometime or other. I'm quite happy as a serious composer and I think I certainly still at my age bring in certain of the behavioural codes of a pop singer. I doubt very much if at the time I would have liked to have been a popular artist because uh, you don't live very long and you don't operate for very long and I have this hankering to keep on going for a few more years. Oh yes, a lot of pop stars have met very unpleasant ends and serious composers seem to have a much longer life expectancy. Well, they've got to work harder for longer periods of time because in serious music there's no money. And also and then there's the idea that you only get good after you're dead. You only get recognised till after you're dead. A lot of the great uh, pop stars have come to very sticky ends. Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Elvis Presley. Is this to do with the strains of making large amounts of money? Well, I think it's partly to do with the, those sorts of pressures that are that come from that sort of sudden fame, success, money. I think there's also a level that, at which uh, the sort of a, a self-destructive sort of personality or a personality that is very explosive and vibrant and, um, well, self-destructive, tends to be attracted to that sort of thing and to be attractive, to be a, 
you know, that talent is often associated with those sorts of things. And, and I suppose that uh, there's something about rock and roll. Part of the rock and roll spirit is a, a thing of pushing the limits, of trying to, uh, you know, go further and further all the time. And that's seen in, you know, this sort of excess in drugs and all the other sorts of things. Oh, I think it's pop music, popular music has kept place with the changes in society and the world we live in. That its great asset is that popular music really does reflect the world of today, much more than serious music does. Serious music always drags a bit. It's always a bit behind. Why is that? Oh, I think it's a more intellectual, it takes more time to create. It is also, it has a more serious view of the world, of course, whereas popular music has an instant view of the world. I think it, I think it depends how you look at it. I think that the desire to, uh, to dismiss it because it's not like classical music is largely a sort of a, a cultural snobbery at one level because it is popular and because it is accessible doesn't necessarily mean that it's vacuous and meaningless and trite. For instance, rock, well, rock and roll is in, in some ways an amalgam of jazz and blues and folk music, both American folk music and English folk music, and you can see all these strains in it, and I think looking at it in, more in a popular or folk context, it is, it is quite complex and, and interesting. Yeah. Can you yourself accommodate both classical music and rock in your own tastes? Oh, certainly. I don't see them as being as competing or being exclusive in any way at all. They do appear to have a divisive effect on the generations in an average family, for instance. I think one of the reasons for that is probably the changes in sort of the patterns of the mass media and the mass communications industry in that uh, there's a sort of almost an, an electronic aesthetic that's grown up and kids that have grown up with television and with the jet plane, that sort of thing, that those sorts of sounds can be more attractive than for people who grew up without any direct association with those sorts of sounds. For instance, Roger McGuinn of The Birds compared the electric guitar to the, uh, the sound of a jet plane taking off and that energy, that rush. It, you, know, you can either see it as just noise, but it, but it is possible to, to find you know, aesthetic value in it. And I think that's, that's part of the difference, is having grown up in the electronic age. I think popular music is, by its nature, always outrageous. One can imagine how a Strauss waltz must have seemed outrageous with all that bodily contact going on. In fact, rock and roll, the dancing in rock and roll is very sparse. No partners hardly touching each other. Uh, I think all the sex thing in the text, which is more, certainly more outrageous than a German uh, um, cafe house song of the 20s. Obviously, that is outrageous. Uh, then obviously the speed that which it goes, and it's pretty up-tempo stuff, by some ill elderly people could of course be misconstrued as being outrageous. I think all of that is normal when you look how the world has changed and is perpetually changing, particularly this century. A lot of Melbourne pubs have recently converted their premises for putting on pub rock. One of the most successful venues to present these shows has been the Tiger Room, which recently had the famous Airs Rock on its program. How does your life change when you become well-known? Well, well uh, it doesn't change a great deal, I, I don't think, you know, unless you're constantly in the public eye. When, when you're number one, which I haven't been to this stage, you know, but uh, I guess a lot of people recognise you in the, the street when you're driving along and so on, and you want privacy often, often it uh, affects the need for privacy. Um, 
also, you have a lot of friends, but uh, those friends aren't always sincere. They just want to know you when you're somebody, you know? When, you, when you're not on the charts and you're retired for a year or so, people don't uh, come around quite so often. They're not really friends. So you have uh, perhaps fewer real friends. You know? What sort of formal music training did you have? Uh, well, I'm mainly self-taught, but uh, when it came time to uh, reading music, uh, then I took a few lessons to learn to read music so that I could cover a, a wider field. Is that unusual? Do most, can most people read music? Uh, in, in the rock world, you mean? Uh, well, I think uh, the number is getting greater, but uh, no, I don't think that many rock bands members do read music. Red Simons is a former member of the famous Skyhooks group. He has a degree in mathematics and since leaving the group has also turned to journalism and script writing. We do hear a lot of stories of, uh, of people who burn themselves out in the field. It's probably always been true of entertainers. Uh, I suppose it's, it's like the, the hazard of a barman being a drunk, that if you're, if you're in a place of entertainment, if you, if you make your living from entertainment, then then somehow you're supposed to be entertaining all your life. You're supposed to be always having fun, you know, and that's an that's a extraordinarily dangerous thing to do most of the time. Uh, with, particularly with the pop field, where it's, it's almost theatrical, there's a lot of people who don't seem to be able to separate their role in performance from their role in life. I think that's certainly true of people like Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix, that they had a particular kind of persona, and perhaps what made them successful was that it wasn't a persona, that that's, that's really what they were like. And it's an enormously self-destructive thing to be asked to be like that all the time. I mean, I don't want to have to stick my tongue out for the rest of my life, you know, I mean, that would be pretty soul-destroying, I think. Does your band take precautions against excessive noise? Uh, one or two of our members do sometimes, uh, as far as uh, the drummer likes to wear earplugs, especially when he's singing so he can pitch better. Uh, when, when we're playing in a, a smaller room, we bring the volume of our amplifiers down and naturally the PA system is, isn't mixed quite as loud and uh, apart from that, uh, there's not too many precautions you can take. Do you think you develop some sort of natural immunity to it? Yes, uh, my theory is that uh, you build up wax in your ears, uh, which is a natural protective thing for your inner ear. So uh, I wouldn't really recommend having your ears syringed regularly if you're a rock musician. I had my ears tested about two years ago by a, an ear specialist who said that my hearing was about average. Uh, a slight dip in the 4,000 cycle range associated with speech, with siblings. <laughs> uh, 18 months later, I had them tested again and my right ear in that region of hearing had suffered a decline of about 20 decibels, which is a reasonably enormous sort of drop in your hearing. And it's reasonably common knowledge that if you're going to play around the threshold of pain, then it'll have its effect eventually. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. of the Tiger Room, Laurie Richards, has promoted rock since he was 16. We asked him if the financial rewards in Australia were great for himself and the bands. In this country, no. Um, well, the bands have to get out of the country to make it big. You know, it's a very small, small country. There's not enough people to support a business of this size. But they're all striving for an international standard. Promoters can do well. They can live, you know, depends on what you call financial rewards adequate. <laughs> Have you ever attempted to go bigger? to become another Paul Dainty, for instance? Uh, I take my time at my own little thing. I, have, I just progress as I feel, you know, progress. I've heard, I've sort of gone bigger before my time before I could handle it and find out what that's about. No, you take your own pace about it. 
How many pubs in Melbourne would there be putting on shows like this regularly? Well, I haven't counted them, but I'd say 50. In the rock and roll business or close in, that sort of thing, about 50 hotels in this town. And how many times would you put them on, put a show on? Here, hotel here. Uh, we're running Wednesday to Saturday these days, so it's a different band every night. Um, how yeah. many people do you get in, average night? Depends on the band, supply and demand. The bigger the band, the more the people, the more they want for it, of course, but um, that's the way it works. Although, once a venue's got a reputation, you, sort of, you have a certain, you know, crowd that you get all the time. How often would you come and listen to groups in a pub? Oh, two, three nights a week. And how much would you spend an evening? Uh, Twenty, thirty dollars sometimes. So, a week that would be about mm, fifty, fifty dollars, yeah, about on average. Yeah. And do you buy uh, records yourself? Yeah, generally one a week. Yeah. You've got masses of equipment out there. What would be the total investment in the other room? Total investment uh, between five members, um, personal equipment would be around twenty-five thousand dollars. What do you like about listening to a group in a pub? Um, oh, I get entertainment out of it, you know, I usually come to a place where the, the band is favourable to my, my taste, you know. What about noise levels? Can you hear what's going on? Um, noise levels never really bother me that much, no. Can you hear the words of the songs? Oh, yes. You usually pick up l lyrics if they're relevant to, to, to my life or what, what's happening, you know. How important are they? Is, is the music itself more important than that? Um, yes, the music would be more important, I'd say, although you do pick up lyrics if they're relevant. Yeah. The lyrics of pop songs are kind of non-essential in a way. Uh, it certainly helps if you've got good lyrics. In most cases, I think people uh, pick up on a chorus, uh, which is a kind of some repeated idea. Uh, if they're particularly interested, they might actually listen to the rest of the song and listen to the verses to find the justification for this idea. That's not terribly important. Certainly in a live situation, it's almost meaningless because they're interested in the energy of the performance rather than any kind of ideology that's being perpetrated. You're up and Rock is often thought of as being very ephemeral and immediate. Is there anything lasting about it? Well, I think it's very hard to be general about it. I think some of it will last and some of it won't. It's, it's a very, rock as such is an extremely broad sort of category. And uh, if, I mean, if you just listen to the radio, you can hear this enormous range of, of different things that are encompassed. And I think that some records that have been made in the last 10 years will last for another 20 years. Uh, and a lot, a lot of them won't. Does much of its value come from its being an, an accurate barometer of society? Well, I think that's, that's part of its value, that's part of its interest, is the, the sorts of things that are implicit in it, the sorts of values and attitudes and the sort of whole image of the world that's implicit in it. That's one of the things that's, that's interesting about it. To what extent can it sustain serious study? Well, it depends at what level, if at a, a, a level of sort of musical analysis, because it's a, a form almost like the sonnet, perhaps. It's a restricted form. It tends to be, uh, you know, a few verses and a chorus and a, an eight-bar bridge. Uh, there isn't all that much to say about the actual form of it, but the way that the music and the instrumentation relates to the lyrics, uh, an analysis of the lyrics, from you can do it from all different points of view. From, from a point of view of poetry, of sociology, of aesthetics. You look at the musicianship. There's also the element of spontaneity, which is something that makes it harder to study at a, a sort of a rigorous academic level, but it's a very important part of it, is the way it is a, a spontaneous expression, and there is, that's part of its immediacy.